Welcome to Online Worship, here at Christ Lutheran Church in Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey. I'm Pastor Mark, and I'm so glad you are here on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Last week, we began to think about the kind of life God wants us to live. We listened to the story of two African-American men who answered God's call to become pastors, but the Lutheran Church didn't support them like it should. We'll continue wrestling with our vocation and see how we together can help one another live our lives in Christ. If you need a bulletin to help follow along with worship, you can find one on our website at www.clc4u.com. Worship will consist of prayers, a message for all of God's children, readings from the Bible, a sermon, music, and the giving of Holy Communion. If you are using the bulletin, you'll notice some of the lines are in bold. That's a sign, an invitation for you to join in, because worship is something we get to do together. So speak those bolded words out loud and sing along to every song. I'm also going to invite you to feel free to interact with this worship. You can do so by leaving comments on our Facebook page or by sharing this video with all your friends online. You can live into the kingdom of God by simply sharing the worship you are doing right now. So let us take a moment to center ourselves for worship and then move into confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our Comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. And now let us be led in song by our Jean and David as they sing, Come to Us.
Let us share the prayer for this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and all we do empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So it's my tradition after the prayer of the day to bring a message to all of God's children. And I want to think a little bit more about vocation. Like I said last week, vocation is a word that summarizes the answers we give to questions about how God wants us to live our lives. God wants us to love and serve our neighbors, but it's difficult knowing exactly how to do that because we're also kids and siblings and classmates and students and teammates. We're a lot of things to a lot of people. So that makes it hard to describe what look, love looks like in every situation. Last week, I described those things we are to other people, such as being a brother or sister or teammate, as one of our vocations. But as I was thinking about it, I realized that using the word vocation to describe vocations is a bit hard. That was a mistake on my part and I should have used a different kind of word. So a better word to describe those relationships, those things we are to other people, is our calling. You are called to be a kid, a student, and a teammate. And your vocation impacts how we live out those callings every day. One way we do that, one way that happens, is described in our second Bible reading today. It's from the letter of James, and he's going to describe something we'll do many different times in worship today. He'll encourage us to pray, which we just did before this children's message, and we'll also do later after we recite the Apostles' Creed. During worship, we pray for the church, the world, those in authority, those who are sick, and we'll even pray for ourselves. We'll let God know what's on our mind and how some of us are hurting. Jesus was writing his letter to people who he wanted to pray. He was encouraging them, and so he told them to do it. Pray when they are happy and when they are sad. And even when they felt like their prayers weren't being answered, his words were designed to invite them to pray again. And one of the difficult things about living out our vocation is that sometimes our prayers won't be answered in the way we hoped they would. We'll pray for things that don't come very quickly, like world peace, or hear nothing after raising a heartfelt word to God. Moments like these will make us wonder if we should even pray at all. Which might have been exactly what the people James was writing to were feeling. They probably felt isolated, alone, and like no one was listening. Yet the message hidden within James's encouragement is the promise that prayer does more than change the world. It changes us too. It reminds us that we are connected to God, to the world, and to each other in incredible ways we sometimes can't see right away. But that connection is there, and it's what enables us to pray in the first place. And one of the neat things about prayer is that it's something anyone can do. You don't have to be a pastor to pray. You can just be you. God wants to hear from you. And so part of our vocation is to bring everything we have to God. Let God know when things are going great and when your heart breaks in two. Simply pray. Because even in the silence, you're being listened to. And that prayer is something anyone, at any age, and in any calling can do. So let's now listen to three readings from our Bible, including that reading from James. A reading from Numbers, the 11th chapter. 
The rabble among them had a strong craving. And the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight. And do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered seventy elders of the people and placed them all around the tent, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Our reading from the letter of James, the fifth chapter. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faithful will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from the Gospel according to Mark the ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. 
If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. One of the metaphors we use a lot in church is seeing ourselves as part of the body of Christ. In our baptism and in our faith, we are joined to Jesus. We're not saying that we somehow have been transformed into Jesus' fingers or toes. But we trust that when Jesus included us, we suddenly became something more. We are deeply connected to the one who was there when the universe was made, and who had his own physical body broken on the cross. You right now are part of something bigger than yourself, and the you that is included is all of you. That, I think, is pretty awesome. But I can't help but wonder if everything about me truly fits within the body of Christ. Personally, I have a long list of character flaws, a receding hairline, and terrible taste in reality TV that I'm not sure the body of Christ truly needs. And as I grow and change in age, some parts of me are becoming more of who I'm supposed to be, but other bits are burning out or breaking down. I know the body of Christ is meant to be a metaphor, but it's not easy to accept that all of you is needed to make the body of Christ whole. Accepting this is hard, and this struggle shows up when we're talking about vocation. The first thing we want to do when discussing the Christian life is to turn our eyes away from ourselves and towards what we think is holy, wonderful, and pure. But sometimes this conversation needs to start in the place where real life happens. We need to start with us. And when we do, our vocation grows. And that, I think, is what Jesus was inviting his disciples to do in today's reading from the Gospel according to Mark. This conversation is a continuation of what we heard last week. Jesus told his disciples that his story would not play out in the way they thought it would. There was going to be a heartbreaking moment when Jesus would lose, and the disciples would witness the end of that story. But God, with grace and power and love, would reverse everyone's expectations. This was a hope-filled teaching that wasn't easy to grasp. And so the disciples, instead of asking more questions, focused on what they saw Jesus do. They couldn't imagine the one who could cast out demons and feed thousands with a loaf of bread would be overcome by the world around them. They saw power, and they wondered what their own power was like. In their culture, the one who was closest to the leader was the one with power. And so they argued among themselves over who should stand next to Jesus. Jesus, though, knew what they were thinking. And so when they found a place to rest, he chose someone else to be next to him. He invited a child to be in the place the disciples wanted to be. And he told everyone in that room that if they wanted to be the greatest, they needed to welcome and include and serve those who could offer them nothing in return. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, was different because its power included those we push aside. God's story is always bigger than we expect. But John wasn't sure how big that story could be. He responded to this teaching by sharing what the disciples did when they saw someone else 
using Jesus' power to make a difference in their world. They didn't know who that person was. And so they stopped him because they assumed he wasn't part of God's story. This person was able to do what they could do, but he hadn't gone through what they, the disciples, did. He wasn't one of the twelve, and he wasn't with them right now. The disciples couldn't imagine that Jesus made this nobody into somebody. And that's because, I think, they were struggling to see how Jesus' welcome alone had turned them into somebody too. The disciples thought they had to struggle to find a place within God's kingdom because that's how things worked in their world. But Jesus wanted them to see that God's embrace was all they needed. They needed to see themselves as Jesus saw them. And so Jesus invited them to embrace who they are by cutting out the things that stopped them from seeing whose they were. Now, we don't always know what to do when Jesus tells us to cut off our hands and feet. Words like that are pretty spooky, especially when they come from the one who will judge the living and the dead. Yet Jesus chose his words carefully because he wanted to reset our expectations, our understanding of what it means to live a life, especially one that is whole, joyful, and with our two hands and two feet, is not necessarily our vocation. And if we take the time to peel back the layers of what we seek in the so-called good life, we find that it's often built around the expectations of everyone outside of us. We convince ourselves that the good life is whatever our culture defines as success, and we soon seek out other kinds of communities who have no problem telling us who we are. We define our worth by the outside looking in, instead of remembering that what defines us is whose we are. Finding our vocation involves letting go of the things in our life that convince us we are not part of the body of Christ. We need to cut out those things that say our worth and value and purpose is defined by anything other than God. We need, like the disciples, to learn how to get out of our own way and let God's love be love. And when we do that, we can embrace our own vocation to love and serve others in the same way. So this journey through vocation begins with us. We need to start with who we are and trust that all of us belong. Your presence within the body of Christ through baptism and faith means you've already been given your vocation. And you're here to simply live God's love out loud by serving every one of your neighbors. We'll spend the next few weeks talking more about what that kind of love might look like. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a little homework. Now, I know. Asking you to do one more thing on top of all the things you're already doing is a big ask. But maybe this little activity will help root you in the vocation you already have. When you pray this week, ponder and meditate and ask God to reveal to you the things you need to cut off that interfere with your connection to the body of Christ. What do you need to leave behind so that you can see yourself as Jesus sees you. That might mean learning how to prioritize your day in a different kind of way, or by finally making that appointment for therapy, or by reaching out and asking for help. It might mean realizing you need a community to help carry you through, or that it's time to turn off those voices around you that say grievances against others is what makes you who you are. It's possible what we need to cut out of our lives might fundamentally change who we know ourselves to be. Yet I honestly believe that the God who included you, because you make Christ's body whole, will show you how the vocation of love and service can make you whole too. Amen. And now please listen to our Jean and David as they sing, 
Be thou my vision. confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. When God's creative spirit dreamed up the gift of faith, God knew we would need each other to make that gift grow. The church is more than a building or a place. The church is people people who pray and care for one another. You are Christ Lutheran Church, and your gifts make the gospel real in this place. So let us pray for these generous gifts with words from our ecumenical friends of the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand. On my own, what we have to give doesn't amount to much in the light of all God has given to us and in the face of so much need. O God, put together as a congregation what we offer you here in love. Do more than simply add it together. Multiply its usefulness. Bless our gifts, and just as it was with the loaves and fishes, turn it into enough for all. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. When you hear the words, Lord in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. We pray for the church and its ministry. Bless the newly baptized and encourage them in their journey of faith. Sustain all members of the body of Christ, including our bishops Elizabeth and Tracy, and Dean and Maristella, our assistant to the New Jersey bishop. Help us live lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the natural wonders of your creation. Restore damaged forests, waterways, and natural habitats, and lead us to be good stewards of what you have provided. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in authority. Give them, including Joseph the President, Philip, New Jersey's Governor, Corey and Robert, our New Jersey Senators, Josh, our New Jersey Representative, all the leaders of the towns we call home, and all candidates running for election, wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable, and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. 
Today we especially pray for Dolores, Anthony, Sue, Sharon, and Mark, Jim, Jackson, Jean, May, and Jody, Reuben, Faye, Kim, Jody, Lorraine, Lata, Alice, Miriam and Earl, Suse, and all those we hold in our hearts during this moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the worship leaders of this congregation, musicians, lectors, service coordinators, altar guild members, ushers, and greeters. Bless us through their ministry and grant them the passion to continue in their service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all your saints, those we have loved and known, and those from every time and place continue to guide us by their example, and reassure us of your promised salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us move to a version of the sharing of the peace that keeps us safe and connects us over a distance. I invite you to take a look at everyone who surrounds you in your sacred space. If you are currently by yourself, know that the entire church is, through Jesus, always with you. Send a blessing to those physically closest to you, or send a text, type out a DM, or make a plan to call someone you care about and wish that the peace of Christ may be with them. Let us now think about all who are worshiping with us online, via conference call, or in person. In our hearts, let's send to your entire faith community a blessing and wish that the peace of Christ may be with them. Finally, let the blessing we offer each other go out to our families, our friends, our neighbors, and to the entire world. With God's help, our hearts are big enough to extend peace that far. Let us embody the peace of Christ after we leave worship today. We will now move into the celebration of Holy Communion. If you haven't secured the items you will use, I invite you to pause this video if you can. Come back when you're ready, and we will be nourished by Jesus Christ together. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit, across phone lines, social media, and the internet, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You are here not because you are perfect, but because through Christ Jesus, you are welcomed and loved. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. 
Lord of life. In the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now let us be led in song by David and Arjean as they sing, God be with you till we meet again. experience God's blessing through words provided by Reverend Catherine Matthews Huey and Reverend Susan Lane. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be light for the world. And may the grace and peace of God the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. So go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. I'm so glad we were able to worship together, and I have a few announcements before we close. A reminder that if you are eligible to receive the COVID vaccine and haven't gotten your shots yet, please contact the church office so we can get you an appointment. Bergen County has approximately 67% of everyone, including kids, fully vaccinated. Together, we can get that number higher. There's still time for you to feed your neighbors by tending CLC's Genesis Garden. We meet on Wednesday nights, and all produce that is harvested is given to the Triborough Food Pantry. We've already raised over 700 pounds this year, so if you want to help out, make sure you are on our garden-specific email list 
and you can get on that by contacting Tom Kearns or the church office. Thank you to everyone who donated breakfast items to the Triborough Food Pantry. Your generosity, combined with the generosity of other communities in our area, ended up providing hundreds of dollars and over 60 bags of groceries to the pantry. Our next food drive for the Triborough Food Pantry is in support of Care Committee Sunday, which will take place on October 3rd. We're inviting you to pick up an extra loaf or two of bread and bring it to the church that day. Our special gifts fund is looking for ministry projects we should consider supporting. Every year, a financial gift from the Anna and Dominic Rickey Foundation is sent to the church, and we as a congregation vote on how to spend that money. The committee that helps manage that process is looking for ideas. You can find an application on our website and also here at church. We'll be relaunching our two worship Sundays next Sunday, October 3rd. There'll be worship at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. with Sunday school in between. We're still working on live streaming both services, which we hope will happen by mid-November. Until then, our worship via conference call and Facebook Live will begin at 10.30 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. All the information to view worship will be the same. We're just moving the start time one hour later to match our new schedule. You'll also be able to view worship on YouTube at any time that is convenient for you until we begin to live stream worship. I am so grateful for you and for the ways you continue to live out the gospel in your daily lives. It's not always easy to live, to discover, and to wonder, and to just ponder our vocation. Vocation is a big concept and it impacts every area of our lives. But your vocation is your vocation. It's the place where you get to be like Jesus to everyone you know. That can be in your job, that can be at school, that can be as a grandparent, that can be as someone who stays at home and the ways you pray for everyone around you. You have a vocation and no matter where you are and what you're doing and what you're going through, you can live like Jesus. And that is something we get to do and get to support each other to do together.